Welcome back to the channel folks and today we are taking a look at another 417 as you saw in the title and intro there but this one is by East Crane or ENC. They also call this the ENC 202 heavy assault rifle so let's dive into this thing and it's an AEG of course it is not gas well back. When you get it this is the box it'll come in and then when you flip it open it will not look exactly like this because I have a two inch barrel extension on it a different flash hider and then on top of that, mine had to come with an orange tip, so I did not get the included flash hider that is uh, reminiscent of that of a uh, 417 style one. And uh, it also had some orange tape around the magazine, pistol grip, trigger guard, and I think the stock, if I recall correctly. And that's so that way it can get past the U.S. Customs. Um, so yeah, you will just have a black flash hider that will stick out from here. It'll probably be about as long as the barrel extension. Um, so with that, we'll take it out of the box and we'll talk about what other goodies you get with it. Um, so there is going to be the, you know, foam insert on top here, and then you will get one magazine. Uh, it is a 110 round mid cap, and then you get a Dean's to Tamea, Tamaya, Tomato, Tomato, Potato, Potato adapter. And then I think this was from Taiwan Gun themselves. That is where I bought it. It's ironically based in Poland. Um... This does look to be uh, Polish, and uh, they chronoed it at 439 feet per second with uh, a 0.20 gram BB. Um, so I chose the standard version of it, which is rated at 450, and then it's the EC202, as it says. Kind of neat, right? Um, and then you get a generic instruction manual, but it pertains to the M4, and it does not pertain to a 417 as you can see by the illustrations here so dookie and you know like the magazine and stuff like that is definitely for an m4 i mean some of the you know the the idea of it is correct you know what i mean in terms of like you know that is how you disassemble this gun you know you gotta adjust the hop up and this is how you clean a barrel and blah 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 i think there was an unjamming rod in here but i removed it um but yeah that is what it all comes with so we will set this aside but that is the premise of that um not a bad little kit i'm happy that they came they gave it a dean's uh to t tamea adapter for those who may not have it so then this is the gun now i put this uh vertical grip on there and like i said uh here is where you have the would normally have the flash hider that would be metal all black and for a 417 um but i opted to put on this so that way i could house this extra long in a barrel, although unfortunately it does stick a little bit into the flash hider, but that's alright. At least it somewhat conceals it. So yeah, this is the gun. I think it looks pretty slick. I'll just do a little bit of that, showing off how it looks. Nice silver mock bolt carrier there, and then a little warning sticker underneath the dust cover. Nice rail kit, and then there's the front end a little bit there. So yeah, that is the 417. Now, let's talk about this thing a little bit front to back. Now let me get a magnet out. So I think the yeah the flash hider that I bought is steel. Barrel extension is not. This barrel is not. This is not. Uh, something is made from steel in this sight, so that's good. Obviously, you know, no steel here. The rear sight does appear to have no steel in it other than that screw. Um, and then moving up, we have... It's um, steel somewhere in here. Not there, though. Nothing. Other, oh, that screw. This pin. That pin. This pin. But otherwise... Oh, this is made of steel. Otherwise, it's there's not a whole lot of steel here. It's mostly just aluminum and maybe some sort of a metal alloy uh, that this thing is made out of. But it's pretty solid. I mean, no, no wobble there. Barrel doesn't wobble. Again, no rail wobble. Upper and lower receiver has very minimal play, which is fine. Even the stock is relatively solid. It is a six position adjustable stock. And then you have the HK style textured pistol grip with that plug thingy at the bottom and the two screws at the front that hold down the motor plate here. It's a little fat because it's an AEG one, but it has that right, that rest, hand rest that goes up to there on the receiver. And then you have the like, you know, mock like buffer tube nut here. And uh, as far as other features go, this thing does have 14 millimeter counterclockwise threads. So righty loosey, and then lefty tighty, perfect for barrel extensions like this, tracer, suppressor, etc. You have the classic HK style semi hooded uh, front sight, and then the classic HK style sort of rotating drum rear sight, 
So you can rotate to the different levels right there. I like to just have it like that. I think they look really cool, but they're not the most like practical. They don't really work all that well. Um, but yeah, and then of course you have a monolithic Picatinny upper, Picatinny rails all over this, so no M-lock or key mod or anything like that. You have fully ambidextrous functions. So you have ambidextrous selector switch, which works pretty well. It's actually very responsive and functional. It's a little stiff when going from semi into safe, but uh, it, it kind of wears itself out once you use the gun a little bit, so it's not too bad over time. Same thing goes with the ambidextrous magazine release. So there's that. Kind of nice. You also even have an ambidextrous mock bolt release slash catch, so I'll show you that. Oops, there we go. Kind of neat, right? And then, like I said, six position LE stock, even an ambidextrous charging handle, which is pretty cool. So all around, this gun's very ambi friendly. And then you have a very large uh, trigger guard here for yourself. So that way, if you're wearing gloves and playing in the cold, you'll be able to fit your finger through there. And then, as you can see on the bottom, ENC202. And then I guess this is the serial number for it, which is kind of cool. I have no idea what the DH stands for. So yeah, all right. So externally, overall, is it like a VFC? Nah, but is it pretty okay? Yeah, I mean, it, I'd say it's on par with like a SEMA or SIMA Platinum, however you want to say that. It's pretty decent, but uh, I think we should start talking about some of the internals now, which is where this gun shines a little bit, but also has a couple of downfalls to it. So I figured we would start with also how to get access to the battery compartment, because that'll lead us into how you use the Quick Change Spring Guide. So this, the battery is housed in here, and in order to get to the battery compartment, there is a tab right there you will pinch this you have to pinch it kind of hard too and then you will pull down or in this case up if you have the gun upside down on the butt plate it like i said it's pretty stiff and then it'll come loose so and then it snaps back into place so i'll try to see if i can do that a little bit better like that it's very stiff when you first do it but again once you do it a couple times it gets a little better but yeah even still it can be a little tough so like that and there you go and then this is the battery compartment i figured i'll showcase this so yeah you're not going to be you know throwing in anything huge but there's some space right here and then there's plenty of space in the buffer tube um the batteries i find that work best with it are ones kind of like this this is a 1400 milliamp 11 lipo and then you just shove it down into here kind of just wiggle it around until it Finds its like sweet spot. Might need to pull the wires out a little bit. It's kind of a dick. Like, sorry, this is kind of. There we go, like that. And then you plug it in, and then just slide the uh, butt plate over the top of it. It does obviously help free up some space when you pull the stock out. I usually like to use it on three, so that way it's uh, the best length for my arms and whatnot. But other people might want it shorter. Other people might want it longer. So yeah, you would plug it in, and then sort of just shove the wires in there, and then put the butt plate back over the top of it. It's a decent battery space. The stock looks really good, and these batteries are really great for it. You can also use stick-type lipos, but you'd have to shove them all the way in and then have the stock adjusted, like, all the way out to conceal it. Not the most ideal thing, but it is an option. Um, I don't think you could really use any other battery type in this gun. Now, this gun also, as I just mentioned, has a quick-change spring guide to it. So I'm going to shine a light down there once I can find my light. There we go. And there is the Phillips head that holds in the buffer tube. So you need to take that Phillips head out first, which I'm going to do off camera because it's a pain in the ass to do on camera. And honestly, you guys should know how to use a Phillips head screwdriver. All right, so the Phillips head screw is all the way unscrewed. Now, one thing I also like to do before I utilize that quick change spring guide is I like to take the stock off, which all you have to do is just pull down on the adjustment lever from the front end of it, which it may get stuck like that, and then just... You gotta really pull down on it and then it'll come off like that. But again, yeah, you gotta pull like that far. So that's how you do that. Now the buffer tube is ready to come off. So what I like to do here in this case is I take the buffer tube partially off and then I just kind of like let it hang a little bit. Um, and then what I do is, oh wait, no, this is gonna be an asshole. Um, if I can, it's kind of difficult. So right here is the cap for the, uh, the rear of the buffer tube to get access to the spring guide. So then you gotta unscrew this, take some time because there's a lot of threads on it. And then we'll go pan back down. Inside of there, 
you will see your quick change spring guide. So see how it's got a big flat space? What you're gonna do is you're gonna stick a large flathead screwdriver in there to make it so that way you can get it out. So do that, push in a little, maybe a lot, and then you're gonna need to rotate until the stabilizer fins on the inside of there are even with the receiver, it's really bright. But as you can see, it's not coming out. So what you'll just need to do is kind of wiggle it around a little bit until it either does come out or you can get, oh, it came out. Otherwise you could just take a smaller screwdriver and then stick it in this hole right here and just kind of wiggle it around until it does. And then I like to do this. And then there is your spring. Bingo. So this is not the spring it came with. This is a Garter SP140 spring. I wanted this thing to shoot 2.2 joules with some 0.36s on an aftermarket inner barrel and bucking setup. This is the stock spring it comes with. It is like a, it's a pretty stiff M125 grade spring, I would say. With the stock barrel and bucking, it was seeing around two joules with 0.40s or around that, yeah, 1.9 to two joules with 0.40s. Right now, I'm at 2.3 joules with 3.6s. The garter spring will probably have to break in as it is still relatively new. But yeah, if you wanna put everything back together, you literally just do everything in reverse. And then this is the steel ball bearing spring guide. Ta-da, steel. Very nice, very nice little part here. Now, as you can see by this, and by the, the little quad stabilizer fin slot thing that this goes into, this, re this definitely resembles that of a Sima Platinum SR25 style gun. So I'm wondering if the gearbox would be compatible with it as well, because this features a V2.5, AKA the extra long boy V2 gearbox in it that is shared with the SR25, which is awesome because that means you have a 19 tooth piston, uh, an elongated cylinder, 19 tooth sector gear, and then you, you do have some other various parts, but that also means that it's mostly V2 compatible. And it also means that there are parts ready to go for this gun out of the box. So it's not super proprietary or anything weird like the VFC 417 that has its weird 2.2 gearbox, which is kind of bad from what I've gathered. It's a pretty fragile gearbox, whereas this one is just literally a beefy V2. So with that said, well, a long V2, I'm going to put this back together off camera just so that way it makes it easier. But you literally just do everything in reverse. All right, gun is back together now, and then I figured I will show you how to slide apart the receivers. So I always make sure that the magazine well is clear, and then I like to have the bolt forward like that, close up the dust cover, which by the way, this is made of plastic, but so is the real one. So yeah, don't uh, don't fret about that. So to do this, punch out the, or the front pin, which is, you can always do it by hand, even for your first time, and then the receivers, as you saw, are just gonna wanna like jump apart, basically. Um, so they're gonna start sliding apart horizontally, and then wiggle the charging handle around because there's these ridges at the top of the gearbox shell that it likes to get caught on, and there you go. That is pretty simple. And this gives you access to your hop-up and inner barrel setup, which is down here. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but first let's just talk about the gearbox. So, this is the V2.5. See how the cylinder is extra huge? Let me go get a stock, like, regular cylinder to show the difference. All right, so here is a regular, regular AEG, or uh, yeah, I guess AEG cylinder versus the 2.5. Notice how much extra space it has. Like, that's a lot of extra room, so that means it has a lot of extra volume. And they made it a type O, meaning that there is no port anywhere in it, meaning that you get maximum air volume. There's even a nice couple of cutouts here for you to see your piston when it cycles, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, so this is the V2.5, and as you can see, it has an aluminum air nozzle, which has an O-ring on the inside of it. I'm gonna put a photo of the gearbox that was taken and put up onto <clears throat> Taiwan Guns website. I'll put a link in the description below so that way you guys can look for yourself and look at it in depth. But this has, like I said, a stainless, I wonder if is it steel or is it aluminum? No, it's aluminum. Um, stainless typo or full cylinder, aluminum O-ring air nozzle, double O-ring aluminum uh, or brass possibly, um, cylinder head with an extra thick padding on the back of it for shock absorption, AOE correction, and it dampens the noise a little bit. Um, on top of that, inside of here, it features a full metal or a full steel tooth piston with the second tooth removed for better AOE or angle of engagement, an aluminum ported piston head for better compression, and these parts are also going to get better compression. You already saw the steel ball bearing spring guide inside of there. It has steel gears that are mediocre with decent shimming. It definitely sounds better with an aftermarket motor. 
Uh, you heard how it sounded in the very beginning introduction. You're going to hear that it sounds better now because I have an ASG Ultimate Series, one of those CNC motors that has the 22K and 22 TPA uh, torque rating, and it's definitely much torquier. It's hard to tell like in this because this pistol grip is so thick, but you can see that it wants to like, like stick to it. Let me see if I can show something that's a little less... Uh, it's kind of hard to show, but you can tell it wants to pick it up, but it's just not, you know, it's not there. But let's see. Oh, yeah, that kind of stuck on there a little longer. But, yeah, it's hard to showcase when it's inside this thick pistol grip. Uh, so motor's lackluster, gears are a little lackluster, but it has 8mm bearings. And then it also has a uh, regular wiring harness, but it does already have a MOSFET in it, which is what this is. So it allows for you to use, you know, LiPos more safely without a risk of burning out your trigger contacts. Then you have Dean's right out of the box, or a T-plug, if you will, which is what that adapter is for. So all in all, it's not too bad out of the box in regards to the gearbox. The gears are basically the only thing that really needs to go, and the motor. Which, by the way, let me go get that stock motor. All right, here's the factory motor. I think if you can read that, I don't know if you can, though, but it is a Chow Li motor, which is kind of cool. I know that used to be a big thing amongst the teching groups. Yeah, you're not going to be able to read it. It's being stupid. Um, you can kind of see that it says Chow Li motor right around here, but um, it's not very strong. It's not very magnetic. I mean, it barely, it can barely get anything metal to stick to it. Well, yeah, it gets that, but it's like, it's really weak. Whereas this can get it to stick more easily through the pistol grip. That's how much torquier it is uh, because the magnets are much stronger. Um, but yeah, it does at least have a stiff spring around the tower here which helps keep it locked into place better which is actually like really nice i'm gonna keep that around but yeah it's not very torquey at all the pinion gear looks decent though no damage done to it uh it did pull back the stock spring all right but it was a little slow a little sluggish a little noisy too but that's the stock motor and then let's talk about the barrel and hop-up unit so ordinarily around the inner barrel this is also an aftermarket one by action army it's a it's their 6.03 type 4 barrel uh inside of here like i have uh, one of those barrel stabilizer rings but normally it comes with this like plastic plug to go into place of that it has a very long and stiff barrel spring to make it so the hop up is always pinned up against the gearbox this barrel clip on here is kind of garbage it likes to come loose very easily no matter what setup you use but currently inside of there, I have a Modify Flat Hub Bucking and Nub, and then again, this Action Army 603. But this is the stock unit, and I'm not going to lie, it looks a lot like an SHS plastic M4 style hop-up unit. And to turn the hop up, you go down, and then to uh, you have less hop-up, turning the wheel up. So it's a rotary style. So I like to say ease up on the hop-up, and then like come down on the BB. I don't know, stupid. But um, let me show you guys what the stock inner barrel is like, which is this bad boy right here. So this is the stock one. It's a 363 millimeter inner, so like M4 carbine length. Um, it does have a nice crown at the end of it, but other than that, it's not the greatest thing in the world. Um, the hop window is a little rough looking there. Um, but yeah, it, it worked. And uh, Taiwan Gun lists this as either a 602 or a 604. If you look in the written description, it says 604, but in the, t the technical spreadsheet, it says 602. So I don't know what the inner diameter is. It's at least a 6.04. And let me see if I have the stock bucking around. Okay, here's the stock bucking. I have just like a box of parts to the side. It's, but yeah, it's it's got a it's pretty thick feeling. It's got some big lips on it and it feels like it's relatively hard, which is good for running heavier BBs. But yeah, with this, and then the stock inner barrel, which I replaced into this uh, Action Army, you know, container, but yeah, it's definitely the, it's a 410 millimeter, 6.03, it's pretty nice. And it, uh, with this barrel and this bucking stock on that stock spring, it was getting two joules with four O's, which is pretty good. Um, but I, I wanted a little more. So that's why I upgraded it. So yeah, again, we have the Action Army in there, modify flat-up bucking and dub, and then the new motor and the new spring, and that is it. And so far, I'm pretty impressed with it, actually. But I will say, I ran into some issues. The first time I fielded this, I had replaced the hop-up with this King Arms one-piece M4 hop-up unit, which does work, except every now and again, it'll either misfire or it will cause for a jam. But it does seem to increase 
the compression, because I think it sits closer to the gearbox, like I think it is in like, it meshes up. Come on now, don't be that way. It meshes up with the gearbox shell a little bit more flushly like that. But because of that, I think that makes it so that way the air nozzle is a little too in, like far into the bucking. So it causes for some jams sometimes. And, but it does improve the compression of it so you can get a lot more velocity out of a weaker spring. I was using the stock spring and, I was, and with that swap to a Lambda 6.01 or the Action Army 6.03 with the modified flat out bucking nub, I was seeing 2.2 joules with 0.36s, which is pretty toasty. Well, that's the equivalent of 485 feet per second with a 2.0. But it would jam and it would also misfire or misfeed where it would just not feed at all for a shot every now and again. It happened about once every 15 to 20 shots. Didn't matter what mag I used, because I did also get this with six spare magazines. Here's one of the spares. Um, this They seem to fit better into the mag well, too. Like, check that out. So it drops freely, and then this is the one that came in with it in the box. Just doesn't even work. So yeah, kind of a pain in the ass. But yeah, otherwise, you do this. It is drop three. Interesting, right? Anyways, um, so yeah, that hop-up unit didn't really work. And then I tried it with a G and G one-piece hop-up unit, and that didn't work at all. That just completely, like, failed. It, it misfired, uh, where it would, uh, blank fire every other round, and then even when it would fire, it sounded like it was about to jam. So yeah, not good. So I think you're gonna have to stick with this dumb hop-up unit. I'm not a fan of it. You could try other ones. Might work, might not. So I'm gonna get this back together, and then after that, well, you know what? I might as well just do it on the camera just to showcase how you do that because I think that is important. So yeah, you'll just shove this back in here. Make sure that that barrel spring is around there and nothing came undone. Make sure that lines up nicely. And then what you need to do is just line these up like so. And then what I like to do is I kind of like to hold it upside down. Get it sort of... Yep, 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 yep. What you'll have to do is wiggle the charging handle like that. That really helps out. And then it'll kind of just go together nicely. Yeah, hey, it would help if the hop-up unit was straightened out. There it goes, okay. And then it should just click together. There it goes. Yep, sorry, that was being really fussy because the hop-up unit wasn't aligning. And then it should be able to look like that. And then you're good to go. So I'm going to put an 11-1 LiPo in this, we're going to chrono it in its current state, and we're going to go shoot it outside. I will have some other footage, I'm going to put chrono footage from my previous recording when I got this thing brand new out of the box uh, ahead of this, as well as the shooting test, and then I'm going to put the uh, what it's like now after I upgraded it afterwards, if that makes sense. So you're going to get my original reaction to it coming up, my original chronograph reading when the gun was stock when I first got it, and then you're going to get how it is now. So, here it goes. It's ready to fire in full auto. So here we go. By the way, the, the weight, or the, excuse me, the brand of the BB is G&G. &G. Wow. Very consistent. So, that's really hard hitting. Let's see what it's like in full auto. Let's get a rate of fire here, test here. Why did it not measure? Okay, there we go. Okay, now let's see what it does with the fours. Whoo, 2.06 joules, which is like the equivalent, I think, of around like 475 or something like that. Like, that's some serious power that it's got going on right now. Let's see, very consistent too. That was the lowest FPS there, and the highest was 335, so not a very big deviance. So yeah, we're averaging around 333. I mean, there was 331.9. Let's do one more. Yeah, 332. So around 2.06 ish joules. Yeah, that's definitely really hard hitting. Let me let me see what it's like with the hop up all the way off out of curiosity. 
2.08 joules. Okay, so it's about the same. Let me turn, the, I'm just meddling with the hop up here just to see if that does affect it at all. I don't think it's going to. That did a little bit, yeah. Okay, so that dropped it down to 1.92 with the hop up cranked up a little bit. So, yeah, I turned it down a bit. We're back up to 2.01. So yeah, it definitely jewel creeps. Okay, that's a little better. It doesn't help that the shade's partially covering the target, but all right. Look for the white 4 O's flying from above the camera. Okay, I guess that's all we get. Uh, all right, we have .36s in this gun, which uh, are definitely uh, no no problem for this thing at all in terms of uh, how well it can fling them out there. So again, same 70 foot target. Let's rock. This thing's a beast. Okay, let's shoot at a further away. Okay, so we're going to just fire some three sixes at the middle tree right there. And uh, that tree is over 100 feet away. So uh, we're gonna see how this thing looks. And uh, it's sorry that there's not a target hanging on it to guarantee that I'm hitting it or anything, but you'll hear it once the BBs strike it. Alright, so we are here at the Chrono. I have 0.36 gram BBs by Mad Bull loaded into the magazine and 11 one light bow in the stock. Let's do this. So other than that one that dropped down to 369 for no reason, you can see it's pretty consistent. 2.32 joules or 2.33 joules is like 495 with the 2 so it's pretty toasty. This is definitely a very hard hitting rifle. I am not going to go full auto with this thing anymore because I don't want to kill the gearbox. This has an SP140 spring in it. I'm not saying the gearbox is going to die, I've heard that the ENC gearboxes are pretty strong but I don't really feel like risking it. Um, I'll throw some 2.0s in here for you guys just to see if it has any kind of like jewel drop or anything like that. You know, if the jewels decrease after I do this. But yeah, this is definitely not a soft gun. Okay, so now I have it loaded with a few 2.0s and as you can see, if it only shot 370 with a 2.0, that's a drastic difference in terms of the muzzle energy. But here we go. Oh, there it goes. I think that first BB was like a 3.6 still in there. 502 feet per second. Wow. Oh my God, it shattered the BB. 500 feet per second. That's a lot of power with a Garter SP140 spring. And I'm surprised it actually didn't decrease in joules at all. It looks like it went up a tiny bit. It's at 2.36 for that shot instead of like around 2.3 to like 2.33 like it was seeing with the 3.6s. So that's pretty interesting actually. But god damn, that's crazy strong. Now it's out of ammo. That one's almost 2.4 joules. Oh, that's jam. That was strange. I think it was just because I was holding it upside down. Wow, is that a strong gun. Okay, now let's go shoot it outside at my targets. All right, so you guys are zoomed in on the 70 foot target, which is like 21, 22 meters. We have the 417. And we have it with 0.36 gram BBs. We're gonna be shooting at the target. It's a nine inch diameter target. It's a little bit bigger than a headshot size target. Let's go. Whoops, that was my bad.
As you can see, at 70 feet, unless you suck like me, you're not going to miss, and it's an easy target with this gun in this current setup. And when it was stock, it was still pretty good at this uh, range. So now we're going to zoom in at my 125 foot target, or the 40 meter target, roughly. Alright, so this is my 125 foot, or roughly, I would say it's like 37 or 38 meter target. It is still the same size, 9 inch metal diameter target and uh, 9 inch diameter metal target, I said that weird. 0.36 gram BB, same gun, same brand, everything like that. And we're gonna shoot all the way at it. It's really far away. I might miss my first couple shots as I'm trying to like acquire my aim. But once I do, you should start smoking it pretty consistently. So let's get that going. It's gonna take me a few shots, so I apologize. Got a spare mag with me. These mags, this gun only shoots shittier when the magazine's about to run out of ammo too. It's like your indicator like, oh, it's got less hop up and it looks slower in velocity. Yep, it's about to run out of ammo. So let me line up my shots again here and then we will continue plugging away at it. I think you get the idea. This is definitely a long range target to shoot at. Okay, so final thoughts on the gun. Excuse the mess, but I like this gun quite a bit. So as you saw, once I sort of re, like was able to acquire my target, I was smoking the target pretty consistently. I did miss a few shots, and there were sometimes where the BB would drop and it would hit the post the target was connected to. You'd hear like that tink, tink noise, um, but obviously you could hear it when it would hit because it'd be like tink, tink. So it was doing pretty good. Um, if I had a better, if I had like an optic instead of having to try to use these iron sights to aim, oh man, I bet you I'd be even more accurate with it. That's definitely more me than I think the gun, to be honest. Um, I can take that fall, but the gun is a little inconsistent in terms of like long range shooting. It's not the best, but as you saw, those BBs had a lot of room to travel. Um, again, like don't mind, uh, you know, like don't worry about, you know, them flying too far past the target. Um, there's a big ditch behind those trees, so yeah, they're just gonna land and hit the ditch. But yeah, it is, it is a powerful gun, and it definitely has a lot of range potential. And I would say that right out of the box, is it like a DMR? Nah, it needs a little work before it is. But would it give you an extra advantage over regular AGs at the power level it had out of the box? Yes, it has more range, a little bit more accurate than your average $280 AG, which is what this retails for on Taiwan Gun. On top of that, it definitely hits hard, and like I said, it does fly farther. Um, any, you know, the gripes I've just had about this gun, sometimes the mid-caps, if you overfill them on accident, they start to get stupid in how they feed. They don't like 4.0s, it seems. It seems like .36s is kind of their limit. 4.0s, they get a little weird on the feeding, but you could probably just put stiffer magazine springs inside of there to make them feed with 4.0s better. Uh, they're kind of plasticky and cheap, but they're like 14 bucks. so what do you expect, right? I also fielded it... Another time where I had the stock hop-up unit, but I had a Lambda 601 with the modified flat-out bucking nub, and it just, it was dog shit. Inconsistent as hell, all of a sudden, out of the blue. Some BBs would be like, whoa, and fly up, and then some would just kind of fly straight. And I'm like, okay. Um, on top of that, uh, the other thing, too, is like just how like weird it is about the different buckings and barrels used in there. I've tried the g, &G Green, a Crytac Blue... Uh, Maple Leaf Decepticon, Maple Leaf Super Macaron, 60 de or 70 degree Decepticon, 60 degree Super Macaron, and then the modified flat out bucking nub, and then the stock one, and this one is the best one. 
Um, the other ones it didn't take too kindly to. It liked the Crytek one, but it lost a lot of velocity with it. But that one was really accurate in here. So that one's not a bad option. But the GNG Green it sucked with. It lost way too much velocity, and that thing cannot hop heavy BBs very well. At least not... At least it didn't for me. Um, it seems to do fine with like 3.0s, 3.2s, but anything beyond 3.2s and it just struggles. Uh, same thing with the Crytek. The Crytek one did okay with 3.6s though, but 4.0s it was like... <gasps> for some reason these hop-up units just don't like the Maple Leaf one, so don't recommend those. Um, and then the stock one just kind of blows because it's just a standard speed bump style one. It's fine when it's left alone, but it's not very good when you're trying to use it like as a DMR bucking. Um, the Lambda 601 did not like this this uh, this hop-up unit, the stock one. Not a fan of it. It was a fan of the King Arms until it would jam. And then, lastly, I would just say is another thing to note for those of you who are realism buffs, is the stock. The stock, the buffer tube in particular, is not a 417 spec buffer tube. Any regular M4 stock can fit on here. And why don't I show you guys that? All right, so I'll take off the stock real quick. You just gotta, you gotta mine the wires when you do this. You don't want to get them caught up on it and crush it or anything. All right, so there you go. So then there's that. This is off of a Sima Platinum M4. So just shove the wires through there. Feed it through. Be careful. Okay. There's that. And as you can see, there it goes. Except it's just stuck because it's an ass. There we go. See? Now you can put a regular stock on there, which is kind of handy. It's a double-edged sword thing, right? If you want a different stock on here to house a different, um, you know, like a nunchuck style battery like that would fit in here, you can go for it. You can also put the classic HK416 style one on there, the one that's like chunkier um, or whatever you want on there, but it's not a 417 spec buffer, which I know bothers a lot of people. And then also it, I don't know if this is how it's supposed to look, the gas block, but that looks kind of cheap and chintzy. I feel like my VFC one looked better. But otherwise, I don't really have a whole lot of complaints. I would say the motor definitely needs to go, barrel bucking could be changed, and then eventually I'd like to replace the gears. But overall, I'm pretty happy with this gun. Would I recommend it? I would say yes. Whether you're looking for a good kind of battle rifle, heavy assault rifle, a DMR platform to build off of, or just like an overall decent AEG, this is it. Um, it was 280 bucks. the shipping was $40, so it's 320 for the gun, and then the magazines were 14 or 15 bucks a piece, 110 round mid caps. It's a good setup. All in all, I got six extra mags, so seven mags total with the gun, and it was only about 405 bucks shipped to my door. Not too bad. Taiwan gun was, too, was, was very quick about it. I think it arrived within 10 days. On top of that, it made it through customs just fine because I live in the United States of America. So I was really happy with this. The other thing just to note too is it doesn't have any HK trades, although I did see on a Reddit post where a guy got one of these and it had HK trades on it, so that was kind of interesting. So there might be two different versions of this, the Taiwan version slash Asia version that has the trades because like they don't give a fuck over there. And then, you know, the international version where H&K does give a fuck and those countries have to give a fuck because H&K will come down on them uh, or the stores in those countries will have H&K coming down on them if they have HK trades all over the guns. But... That is the East Crane or ENC Heavy Assault Rifle, you know, EC-202 or the ENC-417. Check it out on TaiwanGun.com or other websites. It just came out a few months ago, so it's pretty new to the market. We might see some more upgrades for this, but I like it. I love that it has a V2.5 gearbox. It's solid. I got it shooting pretty good, and it's one of my favorite replicas ever. I love the 417. I'm really happy with it, so hopefully the next time I field it, now that I have the different inner barrel bucking, or inner barrel and hop-up setup, and I'm using three sixes, hopefully this thing works really good, because uh, I had troubles with it my first couple times, because I, you know, I messed with it. If I had left it stock, it probably would have been a lot of fun too. So with that said, guys, stay tuned for more content, check out the EC202, see if it's for you, and as always, happy airsofting.